Hello and welcome to Dakota County Parks Pollinator Garden Program. My name's Megan. Hi, I'm Kelly. And we both work as naturalists for Dakota County Parks out here at beautiful Lebanon Hills. Today we're going to be talking about creating some habitat for those all-important pollinators, birds, bees, butterflies, beetles, moths. moths. All kinds of organisms help make this world go round by helping pollinate our plants, both plants to enjoy visually and plants that provide food for us. Um, so creating habitat for them is a great little something you can do to help out the environment. So in today's video, we're gonna cover how to survey your site to figure out the best plants and then how to select those plants, followed by garden maintenance as well as adding some features to your garden that can really highlight um, your garden as well as helping the pollinators as they pass through your yard. So let's get started. Well, I'm standing here in what we call our big backyard. This is in front of the visitor center at Lebanon Hills. And it's a great example of transitioning a turf grass area into a natural native Minnesota prairie. In 2018, we mapped out this area, figuring out the wetter spots and the drier spots. And from that map, we were able to determine the best places to plant our native plants. And we've slowly transitioned this space to provide a lot more habitat, um, resting area, as well as food and shelter for pollinators, as well as small animals, and lots of birds. So come on out to Lebanon, check out our big backyard. We have a display garden as well that's part of the prairie and that really highlights some great um, native plants you can put into your garden as well. When you're choosing plants for your habitat, for your pollinator garden, whether it's a patio pot or a city lot or you have some land out in the country, um, things to consider are choosing the right plants for the right place. So you need to know your landscape before you put your plants in. Having your heart set on a particular plant but not having the right situation for it can just lead to a lot of frustration. So know what you're working with and that includes tracking the sun, so the amount of light that the area where you're gonna put your habitat, your pollinator garden gets, how much sun does it get during the day, and what time of day it gets sun can be important factors to consider. You also want to take into consideration your soil type and how much moisture it gets and or retains. If you're going to be able to water this area on a regular basis, if you don't get enough natural rain um, and take that in consideration too. So soil type and moisture level that you get and then the other critical thing that you want to make sure you have going on when you're selecting your plants is we're looking for the biggest bloom time that you can get. You want to have plants that start flowering in mid-April, if at all possible. For example, we have the Pask flower is a great little native prairie plant. Um, a lot of us have blue violets that just come up naturally in our yards. That's another great native early spring bloomer um, that pollinators enjoy. So you want to have something that starts blooming in mid to late April and you want to have a selection of plants that allow you to have some bloom time going up until we get our first frost in mid-October and that can be plants like asters, and goldenrods are both great plants that will bloom up until the frost and provide a lot of nectar and pollen for pollinators as they're getting ready to migrate like the monarchs or pollinators that are getting ready to hibernate and go down into that leaf litter for the winter it gives them a little extra something so having that extended blue time april through october is a great thing to select I mentioned goldenrod and some people might be thinking, uh-oh, allergies, but one thing for native plants, especially since we're, we're talking about pollinator gardens and pollinator gardening, is these plants are pollinated mainly by insects and their pollen is typically a heavier pollen grain and it's sticky. So it's not blown around by the wind like ragweed is. It's a wind pollinated plant. 
Most of these, the reason we're planting them is they are providing food and pollen for pollinators and insects. And so that pollen tends to not cause issues with allergy sufferers. So you actually are helping yourself out if you do have allergies by putting in some of these native pollinator plants. In addition to considering the flowering plants, the forbs for your pollinator habitat, you might also want to consider having some native grasses or maybe even some small shrubs. The reason for having plants that are not the, the flowery showy ones are twofold. You're providing some structure to your garden and a lot of our native flowering plants can get tall and kind of floppy and having some grass or shrubs in there helps to support them and hold them up. It also provides kind of a break if you want to switch between species. It allows you to transition and put that in there. Um, so having that structure there provided by the grasses can be a great thing to add to your garden. Some of our grasses are also the host plant for the caterpillars for some of the pollinators that you want to attract. So having that there for them to forage on and eat when they're in the caterpillar stage is an important part of your pollinator garden. And they also provide that sheltering space for smaller organisms to get out of the wind or get out of the rain or find a shady spot to rest during the hottest part of the day. So keeping that in mind that you want to have some additional things to just flowering plants in your planting plan for your pollinator garden. So to get started, maybe you don't want to commit to uh, an entire yard project or you don't have a yard space or you're unable to make any changes to your yard space. A small version that still provides some needed habitat for various pollinators is what we call our patio pots here. And these are simply some 12 inch pots. We fill them up with a mix of rocks and soil and then went ahead and selected different plants that uh, seem to do well in smaller pots. Uh, and we put a maximum of three plants in there. When you start out, the plants are gonna look pretty small, um, but they will fill in and make the pot full by the end of summer. So in each of our pots here, we put uh, a grass species, and then we picked two uh, wildflower or flowering plant forb species to put in there as well. Um, and then set them outside and let them go to town. And these were planted a year ago in the spring. Uh, they had a great growing season last summer. Uh, we had a number of different pollinators coming to use them, both bees and butterflies. We even had monarch caterpillars on the swamp milkweed in the pot. Um, but then uh, they did great all summer long. And then for winter, we just left them outside to overwinter as is. And then as you can see, they've been trimmed up and they're ready for the spring growing season this year. So having a, a little pollinator pot or patio pot out there for them kind of acts as just a nice little pit stop. And it gives you a chance to get into pollinator gardening without the large scale commitment. When it comes to cleanup for your garden, a lot of us learn that you do a big cleanup in the fall at the end of the growing season to put the garden to bed, so to speak. But when you're working with native gardens for pollinators and habitats, you, if you can, at all, if at all costs, you want to try and leave as much of that structure and, and plant material behind for the whole winter as possible because it provides a lot of shelter and resting area for pollinators to overwinter either as adults or to have laid their eggs or have their larvae in there to give them a safe place to make it through the cold times. When you do go to clean up in the spring, you want to wait until we're consistently above 50 degrees. That gives all the pollinators a chance to wake up and hatch and uh, metamorphose and move on in their life cycle so that they're ready for the next stage. If you have a, a taller plant with thick stems and you're trimming out the leftover growth from last year, a good rule of thumb is to leave about 12 to 15 inches of the stem from the previous growing season 
And that gives our solitary bees, like mason bees, uh, a place to go ahead and naturally place their eggs. And this stem right here actually has a uh, leaf cutter bee has started building a nest in it. So um, that's one thing you want to keep in mind when you are starting to clean up your garden in the spring. In addition to leaving the, the longer, firmer, stiffer uh, stems and stuff left over from last year, leaving behind the growth from the previous fall, leave some seed options for some of the birds that come to your garden in the winter. But one of the things that you can do that helps the pollinators out a lot is not pick up all of your leaves. You want to, in the fall, leave your leaves. And that creates this great layer for pollinators to either overwinter as adults, like the morning club butterfly, or to lay their eggs or have their cocoons and chrysalises put down into the uh, the caterpillars can go down into that leaf litter to rest as pupa over the winter. And so leaving that behind gives them a chance to have a place where they can be thermally protected during the coldest part of the winter. And again, you wanna leave that leaf litter, either you can just leave it and let it crumble up and it makes great fertilizer and bedding for your plants, or if you really do need to clean it up, again, wait until we're at that 50 degree mark before cleaning that up and giving those pollinators a chance to get out and on their way. A butterfly puddler, as we said, helps to provide uh, extra nutrients and minerals and things for the butterflies so that they are nutritionally complete. Um, it can be any kind of shallow dish like we have here. This is just a, a saucer from a planter. Um, and you'll notice that it's full of sand. Sand in and of itself doesn't provide a lot of nutrients, but what's nice about it is that it holds the moisture um, and just provides a medium to, to, uh, to distribute the nutrients for your butterflies. So mixed in with my sand, I have some compost from my compost pile and that helps add in some nutrients. Uh, if you buy your compost from the garden store or anything, uh, you actually might wanna get one that has some manure content because that has lots of good minerals and stuff in there for them too. Mine does kind of double duty. I've got some crushed eggshells in there for the birds to get too. Uh, you can always throw out a couple little bits of overripe fruit uh, and the butterflies will eat off of that individually and, and straight up off the fruit but it also does a double duty of attracting some smaller insects and gnats and stuff, and hummingbirds actually really like that to come and grab some extra food there. So those are some things to put in in your puddler, and then you can either just let it get wet naturally from the rain, or if we're in a dry spell, you can get it wet once a week, and then that provides those nutrients for the pollinators. Providing fresh water in your habitat is really really important that's probably one of the hardest things for animals to find out there is some fresh water especially in developed areas so providing it whether it's just a bird bath or a little dish um, is a great thing to do you want to change it frequently so that you don't get a lot of algae or dirt buildup or feces from animals coming to visit but one thing that you want to make sure you put in there are some rocks or pebbles so that there's something, some surface outside of the water um, for the smaller birds to land on, but also for the bees to come and get some water. Um, bees, whether it's the native bees or if somebody in your neighborhood or you raise honeybees, um, they need a lot of water to survive. And so they're gonna come and land on the rocks and come to get a drink. So having something out there that's easily accessible for them and the birds is a great option to add to your habitat. Thank you again for joining us today to learn more about pollinator gardens. We hope you learned a lot and feel like you can start your pollinator garden, whether it's in a patio pot on your balcony or somewhere in your backyard. So to take the next steps and start looking for plants, hopefully you've got your, your plan together, you've got your yard map, you know what you wanna do, you know what plants are gonna work best for your site. Um, the DNR actually has a great comprehensive list of the nurseries in Minnesota and places where you can purchase native plants um, throughout the state. 
And that is uh, something that you really want to be paying attention to when you are ending up purchasing your plants is that they are actually true natives um, and not cultivars because cultivars are often bred for showy flowers or growth habits or things like that. And they're not bred for the nutrition. And if the reason we're planting this is to provide pollinators with food, shelter, and space, um, you really want to look for those native plants. And in addition to them being actual natives, you want to make sure that they are ideally nursery propagated and not harvested from the wild. And also that that nursery does not in any part of the plant production use neonicotinoids as, uh, as an application to those plants um, because those are incredibly harmful chemicals to a lot of our pollinators. So check those resources out and happy pollinator gardening. <laughs>